welcome. Yes, good. Try. Let's welcome Jack Etridge. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I got here yesterday. It took about 15 minutes to get here, which is pretty much uh, quicker than it took me to get into London from Guildford. And Guildford's the kind of UK games industry hub, which is where I've basically been for the last few years. So um, I wanted to talk about innovation. It's kind of, as a designer, that's, that's the one thing that really excites me, is trying to do new things. Uh, and I've been doing that uh, for the last few years at various companies, um, and now I'm basically going to go out and do that on my own, which is very exciting and scary. So I thought I'd just give you a bit of an idea of where I came from first, and then talk about the kind of ways that we want to innovate at this new startup we're doing. Um, I didn't know what the kind of flavor of the room was, if we got mostly students or indie devs, or how about students? Crikey, right, okay, so that's mostly uh, indie devs, or um, uh, no interest in games, and it's just here for the free lunch, or? <laughs> I knew it, okay. Okay, well, all right, so this is going to be a bit self-referential. I'll go, I'll go from the start, because I basically went to this university in Farnham called the University for the Creative Arts. The deal was I wanted to be a game designer, but in England at the time, there was about 280 game degrees, and more or less four of them were accredited, which meant that only four of them were kind of approved to give you some kind of work. Um, and so I went into a film degree instead of a games degree, because I thought I could learn some interesting skills that games were starting to kind of monopolize on, but it's still in their infancy, and even now, we could say they're still in their infancy, and the main one of them being storytelling, you know, just the way we can kind of resonate with characters and feel empathy for them, uh, and then you're talking about things like mise-en-scene, like the dressing of a room, and you know, what the color tones mean, and the props, and the world that they embody, uh, and then things like sound design, which is where I ended up falling in love and doing a lot of sound design, which was completely unexpected. Um, but no one else on my course actually played video games, so it was a very isolated time. I was just there, basically just focused on film, which wasn't even a love of mine, and wanting to play games all the time, other than uh, some midnight micro-machines that are flat somewhere, but that was a very different thing. Um, so because I knew I was going to do this talk, I dug up an old piece of coursework that I did when I was in my first or second year, which I haven't watched properly in eight years, and I can't believe I'm actually going to show it because it's massively embarrassing. But this is, it was for, we had, to do a, we had to do a personal project in any way we wanted. So this is just something I threw together at Christmas, and I thought it might be relevant for this room, especially if many of you are students. I'll, I'll try and talk over it because it's a bit awful to listen to. This is before I knew I was going to be a sound designer. <laughs> but basically, this was me kind of trying to express this, this division of stress between home, my personal life, wanting to work in video games, doing a, a film degree, ignore that, that was the student life, um, and also trying to do jobs and things like this. So this is something, and, and it was also, it's kind of how I discovered my, my particular interest in video games, an area of it at least, which is that Games are very much obsessed with scores and points and gamifying everything, and it's a very zero and one, yes and no, black and white world. And life isn't really like that. So when I kind of put this together, it was me saying, okay, if my life was a video game, it would be this kind of emotionless, you know, very just like robotic and computery sounds and stuff. Um, when actually, me breaking down in my car was, you know, very stressful and annoying time when you've got no money. Um, but, you know, I thought I'd just reference Street Fighter instead. So, um, some of the lecturers liked it, the rest were a bit confused, but, you know, I moved on. I basically went from graduating in sound design, working on a couple of films, and I went into my first company, which was EA Bright Light in Guildford, which was just down the road from Farnham. And so this was, you know, a really exciting place to cut my teeth, suddenly you've got these glass elevators and there's like cars driven through walls and there's a rock band area and I was like in you know in heaven and you got all these people that have been working for years who are a lot more jaded than I am but for me it was you know really exciting time and it was my first job there was an audio tester so it was I wasn't experienced enough as an audio designer but what that allowed me to do was get into the industry kind of see how it works 
without having any responsibility if something sounds rubbish. So then at my next company, I could actually go in as a sound designer and know how it's all going. And this was a particularly interesting project because it was a Harry Potter game. And if you, I kind of went in there being like, oh, this studio, they make Harry Potter games, they're kind of okay, they're nothing special, you know, I'll start with a mediocre team. But it turns out they were a fantastic team, and I learned a very interesting lesson about the video games industry and when you're doing licenses. And that is that when Harry Potter comes out in nine months' time, there has to be a game on day one. And you know, a good game will take two or three years to make sometimes. So them having to then do one game within about nine months with a brand new engine, and then do the part two of the movie four months later, make a whole new game, is you know, a, a mental thing when you think about it. And it suddenly kind of explains why there's this, this kind of constant repetition of it, like franchise tie-in games not being you know that fantastic, and it's just you know it's a production issue. So that was my first experience in video games, and then I went to another company called Rebellion as a sound designer. And so this is very different. Suddenly it wasn't so elegant, you know, it was, it was kind of on an industrial estate and a lot of passionate people there, but a very different world. Um, and rather than doing Harry Potter, we were doing. I was basically working on these four different things. We did a, a game called Never Dead, which was particularly Another interesting project, we were working with Konami. And so Konami had a director, Shinta Nojiri, who was, I think, Hideo Kojima's protege at the time, or just before that, on the Metal Gear series. And he came down to lead the game. And so it was really interesting seeing how you had an Eastern publisher and a Western developer trying to make this one game together, you know, and how their, their, their kind of preferences and tastes would vary. Um, then we went and did Sniper Elite, which was... Um, an interesting game. So that, that was, I put a lot of love into the sound of that game, which required, you know, trying to work out the sounds or shooting people's testicles off and other things like that. Uh, I find myself, like, in a boiler suit, crawling through, like, all the dirt in a smoking area, trying to get the sound of the sniper kind of, like, crawling through things. And so, if, and if you listen very closely to the soundtrack, every time you crawl in that game, you can hear smokers coughing and laughing in the background. So it was kind of... Doing things with very low resources, but you know, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, if you listen to any of the pigeons in the game, that's actually the audio department just cooing. You know. So we had a lot of fun. And then Judge Dredd was also like a stark difference to doing a console game where you've got, say, 30 megabytes of sound to play with, and then doing a kind of iPhone game where you've got about three megabytes of sound to play with. So you've got, you've got you know, a very big, and then even we did this evil genius uh, kind of like a flash game, and then it was like literally less than a megabyte to play with your sound. So that was very. I learned a lot of my, my kind of skill set here across all the different things like UI and sound effects and ambiences and dialogue, which is great because you'll find that some games companies you'll just end up being the one guy doing footsteps for a year, the one guy doing VO for a year. And so here was a great chance to do a lot of stuff. But I left. Rebellion, and went to this place called Mind Candy, and this was a very, very different company. They did this, this, this kids franchise called Moshi Monsters. It's about 80 million kids that play this in the world, and I had to do a bunch of little voices for the critters, which is really weird. Then you walk around a toy shop, and you can see toys of these things you've made, and it's very bizarre, but it's also very rewarding, because you know there's a lot of childhoods being made here, and I really cherish my childhood, so that's great. Um, but this is a very different way of working. You'd get up at 10, you'd walk in to this view of a receptionist in a tree trunk, and then go and have some smoothies on tap in the bar and some imported Lucky Charms, because they're banned in England, or at least they were at the time. Uh, and then going having, so, oh, <laughs> having a meeting in a tree house, and then going and having Caribbean chefs come in at lunch and make you a nice dish. Uh, maybe take the slide down to your desk and just get some work done for a bit. And then they'll say, okay, go get a bean bag, meet us in the cinema. And we go to the cinema and we watch about the company financials. And then, you know, it's time to learn how to juggle and make balloon animals. So it was very productive, um, but also very exciting. You feel like you're part of this, this big thing that's making a difference. And to see a company very different from where I had been before, which was kind of like, you know, quite modest in their expenses, to something like this, where they would just be like, oh, it's Thursday, so here's a free iPad, and you're all going to Disneyland next week. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go to Disneyland because um, I got a call from Peter Molyneux, who was doing this, this, well, he didn't call me, to be perfectly fair. I read about Peter Molyneux leaving Lionhead Studios to do this new company, 22 Cans, and the whole idea was very 
uh, intriguing to me. He said grandiose stuff, as he always does, like, we want to change the world with our games and things. And I love that kind of stuff. I'm a sucker for it. So um, I went uh, into a meeting room in, in Mind Candy called Vegas Baby, and because <laughs> every room was named after something weird like that, um, and had a phone call with Peter. And he had this very ominous voice, and he told me about this idea for a game called Curiosity. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows of Curiosity or, or no. Okay, so some people, so I will explain it. So Curiosity, um, if I go to the next slide, is over here. It was a giant black cube in a big white room, just levitating. And the idea was that we'd give you no instructions. We'd just try and see how compelling we can make the game based on Curiosity alone. So you'd see this cube, and it would just say what's inside the cube. And as you zoom in, you realize it's made out of about 60 billion smaller cubes. And as you tap each one of them, they fragment, and there's a layer underneath. And you have to destroy one whole layer before you get to the next one. Then you see that there's actually more little cubelets being broken than you are breaking. And you realize that it's the entire world, all on the same cube, tapping away. And there's this life-changing prize in the middle, which will take six months to get to the center of if five million people collaborate, and only one person gets to find out what's inside at the end, and that person wins the prize. So based on that concept, I was like, okay, I'll leave the fun times behind. Peter says, okay, thanks for joining. Bring the milk in in the morning, and I did. And um, we basically started working on that. After a few months of this going, we started working on this game called Goddess, which we kick-started. And this was a very fascinating lesson in, in kind of one of the things that, that backlashed with, with Goddess is that it was a very open development cycle. And so when you're being very open like that, you've got to really make sure that what you're, what you're kind of developing at the time, you're certain that it's going to be in the final product, and you're not kind of saying things that you are kind of still in development and still uncertain. And so what it ended up with ultimately is that we had this mobile game version of Goddess, which did really well, went to number one in about 37 countries. Um, but then we have this, this PC version of Goddess, which is still in development now, which has had you know, a lot worse reception right now. And so there's a bit of a, a, a hoo-ha with all that stuff. Um, but you know, it was a very interesting experience working with Peter, who's a crazy, incredible creative with all these grandiose ideas. And he's just very good at getting a team excited and inspired and very infectious. And so he taught me a lot of stuff about leadership and development and design, which after kind of the end of Goddess and then going on to this new project, The, the Trail, I felt this just this itch to have creative control, to be able to kind of call the shots on my own and go and make some of my own ideas. And that's exactly what we, we've done now. So um, about four weeks ago, I left uh, 22 Cans, and we started this new company, which I've You'll, um, it's an, this isn't a huge announcement, to be honest, but you're the first people to know. So we're going to call the company Flavorworks. Oh, wait, no, wait. I'm backwards. I'm going to go forwards first. Okay, so this is our new company, Flavorworks. Um, I'm with this other co-founder from 22 Cans called Pavli Mihalovic, and we've, we basically want to go out there on our own, do something very different from 22 Cans, which is this very iterative process where you're using Scrum development and you're literally... Basically, coming up with some ideas, going to the team saying, let's plug these ideas in. You spend two weeks to a month putting those ideas in, review them, and then you do the whole process again. And you do that over and over again, and you keep coming up with new ideas, throwing away old ideas, refining some of those ideas, and finding this product at the end of it that is a very different beast from what you initially intended. And so our, our kind of vision for this new company is to say, let's start with this one obsessive idea, and then keep iterating on that, and, but, but never steer too far away from it. So we always know what we're going in with is what we aim to come out with. Um, but at the same time, we want to be very careful, and that's why we don't want to say anything about the game. But as a parting, this is what the, the slide I skipped over, so I'll play it now. Um, as a parting gift to 22 Cans, I'd been kind of filming around the office, filming little bits and bobs, although it's really hard to do that when you're day-to-day -day game designing and a bit of sound design on the side. Um, but this is a documentary that they're going to release. Let's go back. A documentary we're going to release, or they're going to release in a few weeks, I think, maybe a month. And this is a little trailer we put together actually a while ago. And since then, we've developed this 90 minute feature, 
which is like a very revealing insight into the development of 22, 22 cans. Because uh, I think other than a couple of companies say like Double Fine, the game development process has never really been exposed you know, on video that much. So here's a kind of slightly overdramatic trailer for this documentary I thought might be interesting to show. We're here to talk about Peter Molyneux. He's probably one of the most prominent games producer in the UK. The key elements of Peter's games are being God, having a godlike perspective on the world. This is a man who pushes the entire industry. Industry legend, isn't that written on a tombstone? There was something wrong about my persona. Yes. It's Peter promises and he doesn't deliver. The games that I've been involved with, they should be better. And this is my chance to actually make a great game. Celebrated game designer and notorious notorious over-promiser, Peter Molyneux is to leave Microsoft. Peter Molyneux says new studio 22 can. We definitely need to think in a different way about how we bring a team together. To think differently, we've got to bring different people together. I had this idea. It was not to do a game, but to do an experiment. Curiosity. What is inside the black cube? There is something at the center of this cube. What's inside the cube? It's teasing me. There could be anything in there. What it has to be is something that exceeds people's expectations, especially for me, because I get in such trouble about over-promising things. Welcome to the end of curiosity. We are making a game called Goddess. You will be the god of all people that are playing Goddess. We should go to the public and ask them to fund this game. Recreate the God Game Shop. With your help, we can do that. Goddess is Peter Molyneux. Peter Molyneux. Goddess. Peter Molyneux sucks. I get it why some people aren't pledging. He over-promises and under-delivers on every single game. We need your help, we need your support. I absolutely love the odd stuff. I guess I understand why people don't believe in me. Goddess received nearly $1 million in Kickstarter funding, so the interest is there. Now let's see how the actual game turns out. I want to give everyone the power to be a god. I want to give them a civilization of worshippers that believe and love them. So I still really believe that I have got one great game idea that I can inspire a team to turn into a real idea, isn't it? We don't measure good and evil in a scale. We just say, if you're good, you've got to be always good. If God came down tomorrow, if he even looked at someone the wrong way, someone oh, he's not really good. Goodness is perfection. As soon as you do anything that's not good, do you really? I need to prove to myself, to my team, and indeed the whole world, that Goddess can be a truly great game. So that was basically a two-minute summary of the last three years of my life, which is, it kind of really doesn't remind you of like what a personal investment it is you make into a game developer like that when you're, you're doing countless you know, overtime and spending your weekends there and just hating your, your holidays because you want to get back in the office and going through all of that, that kind of passion, but also this, this very big grind to make something great. Um, and there's lots of highs and lows, but it's, you know, that was so inspiring to us that we decided that with Flavorworks, you know, we were ready to do it all over again. Um, so yeah, this is our mission statement for, for Flavorworks. Because we told, you can't go too ambitious of a mission statement. <laughs> so this is ours, is, is we want to change how people think about games. Because everyone in this room, you know, we love games, it's a part, a part of our identity, our lives, but, you know, for me, there's this issue that in the wider world, that, that kind of vision is very different. And there's just a lot of people that are too intimidated to play games. Um, and this has been an obsession of mine. Basically, I've, in, my, in my times when I was a kid, I would actually go and film myself, my PS2 with VHSs, if you're old enough to remember them, and like, give them to a friend down the road who didn't have a PS2. And at the end of the year, he gave me 13 videos back because I just recorded too much for him. This is before YouTube, so I, I, I claim that. And even just trying to film the, film, the, video, uh, the kind of game design process. Um, in the top right, this, these are all kind of artist impressions. But I used to like, I, I would kind of have Guitar Hero tournaments and bars because I just wanted to bring games into a social space. Down on the bottom left, in my old university, we had a big cinema, a bit bigger than this, and it would kind of like the chairs would stack up. And I would put up posters and hire out the cinema to do like private screenings of Shadow of the Colossus being played on a cinema screen. And about three people showed up. But for me, it was great because I got to play Shadow of the Colossus on a cinema screen. Um, and then right there, someone ended up taking The Last of Us, which is a game I love, and trying to cut it into a linear video. And I was very curious about how that read to people who weren't, you know, 
kind of into the romanticism of these graphical video games, like I guess you get used to when you're in video games. So I tried to get my mum to sit down and watch The Last of Us and try and see if she'd cry in the opening scene, which she didn't. She just drank of the wine. And then when people started shooting each other, she, she just gave up being interested. And that was really interesting to me because ultimately that is, it's people like my mum who I want to make games for in the end because I want them to experience the same joy that is that we may feel when we play a video game. But it becomes kind of like this niche, niche isolated hobby when, it, when you're talking about the kind of these really deep core gamer experiences. So I guess ultimately it's this validation that I've been searching for in video games. And it might have come back to when I was a kid and you start with like the Mega Drive and this kind of kid's image. And then over time, it kind of, especially when the PlayStation came along, they started market, marketing that towards teenagers and the clubbing scene. And you started getting people like Tomb Raider, Lara Croft becoming like these these object, like in, almost like the worst example, but it, it kind of references that this is suddenly more than for just kids. And that, that kind of has been growing, but it hasn't really, it hasn't ever kind of, it hasn't continued at that same pace. It's never gone past that kind of early 20s male audience. I mean, and then I think it's because we've got these, these preconceptions to contend with, and people fear that a game is too long. I mean, like a movie is two and a half, two hours, maybe max. These days, you're watching more of like something on Netflix for 40 minutes. But and you know, those things are very, very accessible for us. But with games, we assume that we're going to have to learn a lot of stuff. You know, you don't need to learn to read again every time you open a book. You know, but with a game, we, we kind of it, be build on these foundations of understanding that we've all grown up with as we've played video games. Um, and the other fear is that they're just challenging. I mean, these, they, they're called games after all. You know, like there's the uh, insinuation there is that you've got to win them. And that's always something that's really kind of weirded me out because I've never been a great gamer. I've never been interested in challenge. I've been interested in experience and the interactions that, uh, and how they can create something unique that, say, a movie can. Um, and then there's always the fact that my mum's never going to be interested in some muscly space marine shooting aliens. You know, she's going to be interested in some kitchen sink drama. You know, and where is the kitchen sink drama game? You know, they just they just aren't there. Um, and the final one, and this is you know a very this is a very hard thing to to resolve, is that even when I showed my mum The Last of Us, and I said, oh look how look you can see his beard hairs, mum. Look how real it is. You know, look look at that tear. You know, oh so shiny. But she doesn't care about that. For her, it's still not real. There's still the uncanny valley. There's still that sense that this isn't this is a show that this isn't so, this isn't a, a window into someone's life like a camera kind of uh, kind of tricks us into feeling um, and so with all of those challenges in mind this is these this is why i kind of implore everyone to really consider how we could design for more than our initial indie and core gamer audience um, one, it is good for the medium. I think we're the coolest medium in the world. We should be the dominant medium of the 21st century. And I think making an effort to expand our horizons and try and make our games more accessible for more people is going to you know, really help with that. And it expands your audience as well. You know, like, I mean, it, there's, there's always something kind of hipster and cool about having a small fan club, but why wouldn't you want as many people enjoying what you make as possible? You know? um, and also, I think, in terms of game design, what I found is that it's so much harder to design a game that anyone can just pick up and play instinctively that will last you a long time. I think that's so much harder. I mean, there's, there's a massive skill to, say, tuning a first-person shooter you know, or balancing a resource system. But when you're talking about doing all of that and making that super accessible so someone can engage in that depth, that's a real challenge. And I think you should always be embracing more, biting off more than you can chew because that's always just going to push you and improve your, your skill. And at the same time, if you make a game that people will like, it means you can keep making more of them. I mean, our ambition is that we can keep making, if we make a game that people love, that we love, then we can keep making them for years and years and years. And that's not to be financially driven, but that's actually to be, to be financially stable because you deserve to eat. You deserve to have a good living and love what you do. And you deserve to be able to make more of them for you and everyone who wants to play them. And you get to create something new, and there's few mediums left in this world where you can actually innovate, when you can do something that no one else is doing. So this is the kind of games we usually design. Like I love all of these games immensely, but 
I'm, I'm heartbroken that my mum will never be able to see some giraffes walking, and my sister will never be able to explore Los Santos, uh, and my dad will never be able to experience rapture. But when I'm talking about making games accessible for everybody, I'm not talking about kind of Candy Crush and Farmville and Kim Kardashian, of course. And you could argue that these are really well-made games that engage a lot of people. You know, um, my, my hunch is that this probably isn't the cr these aren't the games that this crowd might want to make. But, you know, th but there's a game and there's an audience for these people, and these are very hard to make games. But this, this, this kind of middle ground, which is like the mid-core game, I think are really great because they are something that has a lot of artistic integrity and they're very rich experiences, but they're so intuitive and they're so ex accessible. And this is the kind, of get, the kind of games that really inspire me and I think there's a great future for, and we're not seeing enough of them. And this is, this is games that are generally in the premium market on the App Store, but they're also on Steam, all of those games. And these are the commonalities that I kind of see in them. One, well, obviously, they're accessible, they're very easy to play. Um, the subject matter, I mean, if you take out the zombies of The Walking Dead, you really, you've got a story between, you know, like um, two people who don't have any other family and they've come together as like a father-daughter dynamic. Um, you've got the room, which is just this constant, like, de uh, this constant discovery of, of what's inside the box. It's kind of like curiosity, but it's very tactile and meaningful. And frames, which allows you to reorder a story as like comic paint to see how it plays out. Um, but they're all, they're none of them are dealing with like, you know, explosions necessarily or, or you know, like these kind of really, really aggressive, these aggressive subjects. They're, they're dealing with, you know, very simple human, human emotions and that appeals to everybody. Virality, they all have a very strong a, a potential to basically engage people outside of the game, to have an afterlife, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Uh, Multi-platform, so everyone can play these games. So we're not just saying this is just for iPad, we're not saying this is just for PC. We're trying to make these accessible to everybody. Um, and in this case, I would say they're more about experiential design and technical design. And whilst both are, bo both are mandatory, it's just that I think there's a bit more accessibility f for people just based on, their f in terms of first impressions, based on accessing experience. Um, and they also give you the option to snack. You can gorge in any of these games and play them all the way through in one sitting, but you know, that isn't accessible for everyone in this day and age, and that's worth considering as well. And then they all have a strong aesthetic. They also have something that's immediately engaging that gets me to want to know more about that game. So just to go over accessibility again, I mean, the key there really isn't a super simple interface. You can't oversimplify. You know, like, it's the same thing what we were saying before, like, if you have 30 buttons on the screen, it's just going to overwhelm your player. Um, what all of those games do really well is to consider that a player isn't going to be able to go click, 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 and just get all the way through the game. So what it does, these games in particular, they give you these moments of interaction, and then they give you a moment to reflect, to see the reaction to your interaction, and then you react to that action. And it's a nice way to kind of lower the barrier to entry in a way that allows you to still have this very rich experience of the game and still feel involved. Rather than fronting all of your rules at the start, which, you know, it's basically like dropping you in the dark, and, you know, it was very common back, back in, like, the 90s when you just give them a game manual and say, work it out. You know, you want to just give them something accessible, let them master that, then give them something more, and then master that, and master that. So very typical, you know, game design principles. Playtesting uh, <laughs> has um, always been a very heartbreaking affair. When you, you're so sure about something in your design, and then someone comes along and goes the complete opposite direction or breaks that straight away. Um, so you can't playtest enough. Just get everyone you can to playtest the game. Um, and my, I, I obviously will always go for non-gamers because I can, see, you know, I can see what's instinctive in that sense. Um, and don't expect them to read those tutorials. They were, I never read a manual for a game. I don't read tutorials now. There's so many games to whet my appetite on my phone or on Steam that I just can fondle them for a little bit, and if by fondling I can get somewhere, I'm likely to kind of follow that route. But if, if it just starts kind of coming up with a lot of error messages, then it kind of just scares me off. Um, and that's the, the, the kind of harsh reality, is that people are very impatient, especially when they're dealing with technology. You know, like, I think, Johnny Ive said something like, 
you, if you taste a fruit that you don't like the taste of it, you, 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 you say the, the fruit's rotten or the food's bad or something. But if you can't wait technology, you blame yourself. You think it's your fault and you know, you're not willing to learn it. So, um, I'm talking about, sorry, man. 20 minutes, thank you. Okay, I'll try and speed up. <laughs> um, so in terms of accessibility, Curiosity was a great one for that. So in that big image, well, the small image that I showed you of the big cube, if you zoomed in, you'd see these very much smaller little cubelets that make it up, which meant that if I tapped on the cube, I could basically make these little shapes. And so we gave people one simple mechanic, which was tapping, the most primitive, simple thing you could do. And this is what people did with it. There was no other rules other than get to the center. But this is the kind of things people did. So, you know, like people would do obituaries, people would do marriage proposals. People were finding out that President Obama got re-elected because they read it on the cube first. Uh, and then it was self-moderating. So people would go around, and what do people do when they've got a graffiti board? Uh, they make penises. And then you've got this kind of army of Italians that went through and turned all of those penises into bunnies. And we didn't have to tell them to do that. It was self-moderating. So it's just very fascinating. And any time I could change the colors of the cube and see how people reacted, and they, some people would tweet that they, they thought they heard the sound change when it didn't, and all sorts of things like that. So it was a very, it was a very kind of extreme example of, of, how, of how accessibility can lead to a lot of depth. Because that's ultimately what this slide was about, was saying that accessibility doesn't equal a lack of depth. You know. So, uh, yeah, this was when I, <laughs> so I got non-gamers to play this game, including my family. Um, and I got them to play Goddess. And Goddess is a game that, with a lot of rules to it. And it's very, it's guilty for the same things that most games are, which is building on our understanding of the games that came before it. Um, and what I found is that this player wasn't led by anything other than her own emotions. She just went for what was interesting to her at the time. She was becoming effect, uh, growing affection for the little people that walked around the world. And their needs and her interpretation of that was what, really, was what really drove her. She was interpreting the wants of those characters, even though they didn't have a voice. And once more, yeah, she was blind to those technical limitations. So most gamers understand if a guy goes inside a house, he's probably, uh, and you, so let me explain what goddess is for start. You're looking down on a world as a god. So when you see a little person go into a house, we just delete them, you know, we hide them away. And a lot of gamers would understand that, that they're, they're, we removed them from the game to save memory or something. But the, these players, they don't know that. They don't understand what technical limitations are, so anything in their head is possible. So they just assume they're still in there and, and they're upset or something, they won't come out. And they'll read into things and then they'll react based on those interpretations that were never there. And we, you know, we said, this is your goal, your game is to put houses on land. And this person just wanted to, to you know, make pools for them and to give them little rest breaks because she felt like these guys were building more than these guys and it was unfair and things like this. Um, and yeah, because of that, no concept of game rules. And I just found this really, really intriguing and motivating for our new company, which is that we, if we use games that have come before us as like a crutch too often, there's people that will never be able to get into games because they haven't grown up with those implanted rules. And you know, God is as guilty as that as many. And with our new game, our plan is to say, if you've never played a game before, as long as you know how to work an iPad or a mouse, you should be able to play this. And so we want to aim for these kind of broader sensibilities. These are things I really love. So um, we want to go for logical challenges over reaction challenges. This is what I was saying before about how a shooter can be kind of daunting to people, is that with a logic, We've grown up in this world. We know what logic is. We know, we know how to talk to people. We know what people are going to be mad with, upset with. And if you can capitalize on that rather than you know, the skills that you inherit by playing the game, then that's immediately a nice way to access them. In storytelling and script writing, one thing that comes up a lot is this idea of internal conflict. So in a game, our conflicts are usually external. That's running, jumping, shooting, punching someone in the face, blowing off someone's testicles and stuff, really. But in movies or a book, it's all about digesting that internal conflict, you know, how she feels about him, and, and I can't believe he did that to her, and blah, blah, blah. And so these are the things that really engage all of us and in many other mediums. And it's so hard to explore this in games because 
we're so used to these conventions of moving avatars around and these 3D worlds. That's what games are good at. It's what we have at our disposal. You can jump into Unity and move a cube around, boom, you know. But you know, that if we don't have any kind of like kind of 3D mapping of how our emotions work, so that it kind of comes redundant there, and we've got to think of new ways to explore them. Again, creative is always a lot. It's a lot harder to make something that's that in, that inhibits that enables creativity than it is to enable destruction. You can just set up a bunch of bricks and then just throw a ball at them and you destroy things, and that feels really great. But you know, there's a lot stronger emotion in creativity, um, and I think these are the kind of things that, if you can find very simple ways to create, such as Minecraft, and which then sells to two billion, then you're going to attract more people. The other thing being, again, we said about the Space Marines. You say about, you know, roller coasters or, or space flight or whatever. We want to. We we think by working with things that are a little bit more familiar to us in our in our normal lives, like humans and, and or even even it's the Lion King, you know, at least the Lion King still deals with things that we can resonate with, then this is a nice way to appeal to a broader audience. And the last one is discovery. I'm I've never been motivated by XP and points and scores and things like that. For me that is kind of that is it's it's, it's got its place and I you know I love to play a bit of Pac Man here and there, but I'm definitely more intrigued by the unexplored area of discovery. As a kind of I think this is something you can see in things like the games I, I, I reference, like The Walking Dead and Framed and The Room, is that you aren't going for score and points there. You are going to see what's the next, the next step on this journey that I'm exploring, just like a page turner. So this is something that really inspired me. In London, there's this production company called Punch Drunk, and they did this immersive theater show called The Drowned Man. Um, and so it's a very hard, weird thing to explain, but it's... It's, it's, it's like 200,000 square feet over four floors, and they've decked this out with like, these forests, but if you go all the way to the other end of the, of the, of the world, you'll end up in the desert. Um, if you go over there, you'll hit some house, or you know, um, you'll hit some car park, or you'll hit a movie theater, and it's this very weird world stuck in the 1960s, and there's 53 actors that walk around this world over all of these floors, and all the audience wear these masks, and they, as ghosts, can walk around this environment, explore any story they want, open any drawer, look into anyone's personal life, and I can follow a character into their home, see them undress, go to sleep, wake up, pour a whiskey, cry a bit, walk out, go to the cinema, talk to that character, oh, I like that character, I'll follow that character, and then I end up going on a completely different journey. And we, about seven of us came out of that theatre, out without, without that immersive theatre, and none of us had the same experience. We all had different stories to tell. And it had all these parallels to level design. You know, like there's multiple playthroughs there. It really, really evokes curiosity and, and gives you like a hint of something and, and allows you to use your own, your own initiative to go and follow it through. And again, it had the afterlife, because this is a cheap show. It's about 55 pounds a ticket and it lasts about three hours. But many of the people I knew, including myself, just tried to go as much as we could because there was just so much more to discover. And there was this community online that would talk about and love it. Um, and now these guys are moving into video games. And I just felt like play, playing this was like walking through Rapture, but it was this refreshing take on an interactive world experience. And this really inspired me in a way. And I think that's a very kind of nice thing to think about is how can you keep exploring influences outside of video games. In terms of innovating, it can be really easy to just make something really bizarre and random, and you don't necessarily know that it's going to be any good. And what we found is that innovating in just steps can be very useful. You know, so dipping your toes into the unknown first, because if you go all the way in there, it's going to be a bit crazy. And you can, you can do a lot by just really thinking about the instinctive reactions. We all know that you can pinch on an iPad. We all know that you can mouse over with a mouse. And these are things that we, we know. You know. Even the people who aren't into games, they know those, 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 those kind of um, mechanics, I guess. So these are things to definitely kind of keep in mind when you're trying to do something new, is to tie it with the familiar. That's what I'm saying there. Um, because otherwise, yeah, you will scare players off uh, if, you, if you start to go way too out there. You, you've, there's been some games that have gone so innovative that critics don't know whether to say it's genius or that the guy is insane. You know. um, 
but you don't, and again, you don't want to spread yourself too thin. If you start with every design you do, it takes so much energy to work out if this is working, if it's not working, that to then go and do that across your entire game with stuff that you've never, you've never had any kind of experience with before, it's just going to kind of put you in a mess of trouble. So for an example, this is what we did with the iPad version of Goddess. There's these world-building games, these free-to-play world-building games that have a very, some very strong conventions. So isometric viewpoint was one of them. It's a very easy way to look down the world. But we had a very, we had two-finger scrolling. So two-finger scrolling is a bit weird to get your head around. So we decided to tie that with a familiar viewpoint. So it, didn't, it wasn't just too many new things for that kind of, that kind of audience. Um, a lot of these games you do by constructing buildings, you'll tap on a piece of land, and then you say, I want to build this building, and it'll cost you some money, and it'll build up over time. But we wanted to do this with a simulated population, so you're always indirectly influencing the world. So then we're talking about getting your little people to come out of one house because they've, they've, they've breeded too much and they need some new space, so they go out and build a house. And so we had to teach a lot of rules, so we leveraged the existing convention of construction in buildings there. And the last one is, in these games, you collect resources a lot by just tapping on houses. They generate money over time. Um, and we wanted to have a lot more of a kind of delicious and delightful kind of interaction where you're always dragging on the world. So one of them was being able to collect all of that currency up by dragging your finger along them. The other one was actually sculpting the land itself. And usually, these lands are very kind of rigid and immovable on these devices. So we thought, if we were introducing new ways of collecting familiar things that we could then adapt that interaction onto new areas as well. So just touching on virality quickly, The Walking Dead was really, and, and Telltale Games are very great at this because they've actually, they're building their virality not only into the game itself when they're asking, oh, I can't believe you let that person die. No, but yeah. Instead, you, you've got that, and then you can go and take it to the community and talk to them all online, you know, and that's a big, just a heated hub. And, because these games are episodic as well, they always keep you coming back for more. And for anyone who's too lazy to play it, PewDiePie and other YouTubers now are just like, they're bigger than movie stars as influencers in kids in America, like based on some chart I found on the internet. But <laughs> so, um, you know, like all of, these, all of these things are ways to get people talking about your game. I think this is really important, especially when you're an indie and you haven't got a lot of money in the bank to like buy billboards inside of buses is to really think about how you can create a, a kind of community for yourself. And we did this with Curiosity. Curiosity was basically like a big test in, in, in that kind of in social media and community. So, I mean, we, when I was saying before about how I would very, I, all I would do is like change the color of the cube and someone would comment on it. Or I'd change the words around the cube saying, stop tapping me, it really hurts. And then you could see on the graph that everyone just stopped tapping it. And people were on Twitter saying, oh, this is sick. I really feel bad about playing this game now. Um, and, and so, you know, you, we were building these ways into the, into the game to make it this living thing that was dynamic and allow people to carry on talking about it. And when it came to the end, because the whole thing was a race to the middle, it blew up on social media and we trended worldwide in three places, which was, you know, a really fun, cool thing. This is just a quick visual way of explaining what I was talking about earlier, about technical and experiential. Every game needs both of these. So, you know, they're very, so they're very intertwined. But I've always sided more with the experiential. I've just always thought about, you know, feelings and, uh, and feel as opposed to kind of uh, a spreadsheet of numbers, which powers your, you know, like your Dungeons and Dragons game. And it's kind of, as a result, is very prominent in video games today. And Whilst games like, say, uh, This War of Mine, they're very emotional, they're very much about emotions, you still, you're accessing them through the, the technical, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, they're using the actual game design to really evoke a lot of emotions by just saying, you've got limited resources and I'm starving. And then, but I think this stuff on the right, which is more of my kind of instinctive way to go, it's a lot less daunting for, like, say, a casual audience who don't know the rules yet. They don't need, understand games, and they, they, they're very kind of, driven by visuals, you know, um, whether that be, you know, a very clear on-screen relationship or just something that looks like a dream and you want to play in the sand a bit and before you know it, you've made your way through the game just from, you know, liking the sand between your toes and whatnot. So this is a big, quick thing on snacking is that, yeah, all games can, uh, well, not all games should be snacking, but if, you, if you're talking about 
trying to appeal to both these audiences, just being able to find regular save opportunities so people don't feel kind of imprisoned by the game, like they can't walk away from it. Because the book never says to you, no, you can't, you can't stop reading, I'm going to take your eyelids open. You know? um, so think about how generally people will access the game, they might just pick it up, they might just go over to there, they might have dinner on in 20 minutes and they've got to go, is having those regular save opportunities. And then consider that people aren't t married to your game, they can stop playing for as long as they want, they can stop playing for two weeks, three weeks even. So if they come back in three weeks and they've forgotten all the rules to your game, they're not going to carry on playing it. They're going to be too confused. So find, either find ways to remind people of what they were doing and how they were doing it, you know, or you know, design for accessibility from the start. Um, and yeah, to go with this stuff, you really need to have substantial short-term goals. You can't just have a long-term goal with saves. You need to be able to say, Oh, I hit something, I'm really proud of that, I achieved what I was after, I've got my feel-good hit, or I've got my, my story twist hit, my cliffhanger, now I can walk away. And so this is something we're, we're really keen on doing, is making this kind of almost bite-sized, episodic experiences that you can gorge in one go, but it allows you to go either way. Um, another thing we've been thinking a lot about with our company is image. You know, you've got... The, the, the indie world is very, it's very uh, iterative, it's very inclusive, and that's great, you know. But it, it kind of, you get some companies that will jump between that a little bit. So with Curiosity, we were going with something very polished. It felt like an ornament, you know. It felt like there was no code, no bugginess, no glitches. I didn't want people to see the code. I wanted it to feel like it was this living thing. Whereas with Goddess, we went very much more for early access and this open experience, and you were seeing the game before it was done. Whereas for the trail, which we're now working on, or we were working on because I've left, huh? <laughs> got used to that, um, is that that's, I think, the plan with that has been to wait until the game's done and then just release it into the world as this kind of polished thing. And I've always been really inspired by that. But you can really, the way you decide to go with, with that image is, is the way people are going to interpret you and your intentions and your, your, your aesthetic sensibility. Um, and I, I want to play, I'll play a little bit of this because I don't want to play too much, but um, I edited this a while ago when I was waiting for an iPhone and I was getting really excited about iPhones because there's a designer called Johnny Ive and he's responsible for designing the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, the MacBook, the iMac, the MacBook Pro, the Apple Watch, everything. He's the designer of, of you know, the, the magic, basically, how it looks, how it feels in your hands. And... The way they describe their products is just so, so juicy that they ended up using him as the voiceover for, his, for, for all of their products. But you can tell like, they are very much extending their, their view of their products and how they want their products to be perceived. So this is a montage of Johnny Ive using nice sounding words. And I'll stop it when it's starting to get a bit too, too weary on you. Distillation, simpler, capable, intuitive, beautifully, unapologetically plastic, polycarbonate components, surface, I'm out. seamless, coherent, out. unison, significant, fanatical care, quality, polycarbonate, bespoke assembly, perfect alignment, clear lacquer hard coat, durable, incredibly glossy surface, soft, matte, microfiber lined silicon, profound, enduring beauty, Simplicity, clarity, efficiency, coherent, typography, or harmonious relationship, distinct hierarchy and order, translucency, vitality, parallax, experience of depth, unobtrusive, deferential, elevates significant design engineering, the integration of significant... Anyway, goes on. Goes on for a long time. And I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I, just, I just get so excited about those products and, you know, I've got my phone in my bag and I, it just, it, it, really, it really just gets you on side with what they're making. And the same can apply to that handcrafted indie field as well, where it feels like you've made this, you know, your bare hands as opposed to, you know, super billion dollar company. But it's really, it's really I think it's really important to think about that perception of what you want to do with your company. Um, one of the things that really excites me is this auteur theory, this idea that if you go and see a painting or you watch a movie, you know who made that movie or that book. So it's, it's something that you'll see it in, in something like uh, uh, 
a Tarantino movie. You always know when you're watching a Tarantino movie. And I think it's a really interesting thing to consider who you are as a creative, especially if you want to engage the kind of more, the kind of more emotional side of games and, and, and the personal side, is to think what it is that you can bring to games that someone else can't. And as a writer, Charlie Kaufman, who wrote things like Being John Malkovich and um, Lost in Trans... No, he didn't watch that. Um, Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind. And he's always been open about being a very insecure person. His films and the scripts are always very insecure, but it gives you this nice idiosyncrasy into, into, into characters. And, this, you know, that's his, 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 his um, you, you know, that's his unique thing, is that those were his differences, almost his weaknesses, but he turned them into his strengths. And, you know, and this, this is what I mean. This is, this is how you can say what has the world not seen before. You know, I mean, Nirvana weren't trying to be Nirvana. They were trying to be the Pixies, and then they came out as Nirvana. You know. um, and so if you can bring something that's unique to you, even if it sounds like that doesn't fit in a game, that's probably a good thing. It means it probably needs to, there needs to be a game about that. You know. um, and contradictions or conflict is, the, they said it's like the backbone of all narrative, all drama. So everything's a conflict. You know, without conflict, you don't have drama. Is there anything with you that you feel like, oh, I really like cheesecake, but, you know, I'm allergic to cheese. And you're like, oh, that's an interesting contradiction. I can make a game about that. Oh, no, I'm not saying do that. Um, and then what are your resources? Because sometimes you're, what seems like you've, you've not got the resources that you initially wanted to make the game you wanted based on this game that you were really inspired to do. Think about what you actually have under your bed. Think about the team you're with and their individual strengths and how that can make something really unique. So, for instance, I have a history in sound design, a history in video. I might, you know, do something that, like that with a game one day. And because um, there's not enough sound games, you know. So these are our, I'll, I'll wrap up now, but these are just our personal aspirations for what we want to do with our new game that kind of, uh, building on everything I've really talked about today and all these things that really inspire us about making this accessible product for everybody that doesn't eliminate the depth and doesn't alienate the core and indie gamer audience. We want to, we want to, make a game that deals with these kind of things without saying what the actual game's going to be. So we want to basically announce the game probably around November time. We don't want to do it before then. We don't want to kind of show anything that's not, that's not, that's half-baked. Kind of like the, the whole Apple thing where you see an iPhone come out at the end when it's ready. You haven't seen the iPhone in its 54th iteration where it's got like springs sticking out of it and stuff like that. So for us, kind of, Less surprising is a meaningful story. I'm really inspired by what we can do with stories in our game, and that's one of the, the kind of core pillars of what our experience is going to be. The other thing is an emphasis on physicality. I, I think in games, a lot, they're very much, you, you, you see them as like avatars running around and stuff, but they very, I very uh, rarely see like an emphasis on, on a physical world. When I play something like Metal Gear, uh, especially the original, that you can actually push your character up against the wall. You wouldn't keep running into the wall and just carry on running into it. You'd actually push yourself up against it and you could knock it and you could hear that wall reverberate and it felt like a real place. And the same with something like Half-Life 2. You could, everything was physical in that world and if, say, someone fell off a balcony and hit the floor, they would, you'd hear a nice kind of collision sound, the dust would kick up and it was really tactile. And so that's something that's really inspired me for what we want to do. Again, we want to go with a striking aesthetic. As I said, with all those other games, they had something very, so something very, um, uh, yeah, something very really unique to, to grab people's attention with. Because we're talking about we're talking about a medium that we said is already hard to gauge people's attention with. Uh, we needed to buy, build some brand new tech, so we've actually invested in in building some technology from the ground up to allow us to do something very unique. And unique would be the last one, <laughs> but unfortunately. I'm not going to show anything, although I don't have any time anyway, because our thing has always been to say, to don't say what we can't show. But hopefully in like about three or four months' time, we'll, we'll have something to show that will hopefully distill some of the stuff I've been talking about today. But whilst these are the things that really inspired us, my hope is that there's some of you that are thinking, oh, I can, I can see the appeal of trying to think about differently about how I make my game and how I, can, how I can branch out to a wider audience, you know, and really change the way the world thinks about games. So um, that's me. Has anyone got any questions? Yes. Yes, it's too loud. Um, we're a bit late, we have the award ceremony in 10 minutes, but 
if there are some short and good questions. Very short, very good questions. Do you have a question? Any questions? Yeah, over there. Hi. I'd Hi. like to think back of your time at 22 Cans. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, uh, the winner of the quest of the curiosity. Mm -hmm. Brian. Um, <laughs> did he finally get his reward? Because I've read otherwise. Yeah, so it all went a bit funny. This is, so after I left 22 Cans, uh, well, after I gave my notice in and had my kind of heart to heart with Peter and went through the whole divorce, <laughs> Peter. Um, yeah, thing, things had kind of uh, kind of fallen off the map a little bit because it, it's very interesting how much they tried, how ambitious they tried to be of everything. But as people leave or people change change roles, or and when you've got a company that small, some things they just they just st didn't materialize at first. And the other thing is, with someone like Peter is such an iterative designer. When he's excited about something, he likes to focus on that and say, "Let's just let's get this in the game. Let's get this in the game." And so Brian was getting this kind of interface for Brian, the god of gods who won Curiosity, to control the, oh, everyone else in the world, was always like this, this design that we knew we had, we knew what we wanted to do, and was like on the shelf as things we want before we release the final project. But unfortunately, the communications broke down with Brian a little bit. We did get him in initially, and he, we you know, got him to play the game, we took him out for lunch and stuff like that, and he was a really nice kid from, from Edinburgh called Brian, 18. Uh, like the life of Brian, and uh, ironically, um, but yeah. So, so w since then, since he kind of talked to press and stuff, I think the company has got back in touch with him and said, "Sorry, that it's taking so long. This is this game still in development because I think most of Peter's games do take about four years to make, and that's one of the kind of weird consequences of coming out on Kickstarter on releasing on the iPhone first. Uh, as, which is a very different kind of world, but still being on early access on Steam, really was kind of a bit of a bit of a headache, you know, and, and a bit kind of bizarre to look at. So I think it's still coming. It's, it's from from the last I heard. Yeah. Good. One, another one. Anything else? Yes. I was just wondering if you would uh, consider like Kickstarter or some sort of campaign like that in the future with your new company. I think people should still do Kickstarters. Um, in fact, I completely forgot to do this, but there's this, um, this game called Little Devil Inside by um, my, some new friends of mine that's a company called Neostream, and they're doing a Kickstarter right now, and it lo it's looking shaky, but the, the game just looks incredible. So everyone should go and back Little Devil Inside. Yeah, plug. But damn, I was gonna, I was gonna put a slide up and everything. But for me, yeah, for me, I think because of, because of the Kickstarter with Goddess and the kind of unfortunateness of, of it not being at that point in the PC version that, that people were kind of looking for and becoming a lot more of a mobile game in its current form is that one, I think, I think it'd be, because I was involved with that campaign, I'd probably feel a bit, I feel a bit unfair if I went to Kickstarter again. But also just that, I think part of that philosophy of image thing, I think Kickstarter is really great for letting people in, showing people what you're doing step by step and having this it's kind of very open connection with your community. But I think one thing that really excites me about what we want to do is that this thing kind of needs a life of its own and needs to just kind of appear out of nowhere as if it was, because there's this thing about products like this, you know, you don't see it as this, this in development thing. You just see it at the end like it was made with magic, you know, like it's a smooth finished thing. And that's something that really appealed to me, appealed to me with, you know, this new company Flavorworks rather than with Goddess where we, we did do that. So I think it's still a viable thing for a lot of people and, and people should do it. It just, I think it depends on the kind of uh, the company vibe you're going for. Cool, thank you. One final applause for Jack. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>